Thank you for coming today. I'm Sunny with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. I am the Cannabis Policy Coordinator out of our Director's Office. Uh, for 10 years before that though, I worked in our Pesticide Enforcement Program. So I feel pretty comfortable sharing the information with you today. Before I get into Pesticides 101, I just want to cover what ODA does in regards to cannabis. And you'll notice I use the term cannabis because for our agency, that's going to be the umbrella term that includes marijuana and industrial hemp. So anything that ODA has authority over, we still retain that authority in the state of Oregon over marijuana or industrial hemp. So that's going to be pesticides, which we'll talk about. It's going to include food safety. So when they legalized um, marijuana uh, and industrial hemp, they said that they are no longer an adulterant in food. So all of the edible items are now uh, inspected and regulated by our food safety program. So we're looking at basic sanitation. And that starts at the extraction step. The folks making a food product to include things like tinctures and capsules, uh, stereotypical brownies or cookies, gummies, down to the retail stores. So the retail stores also need a food safety license to make sure that if they have cold drinks that they're keeping them cold, that they're keeping rodents and insects out of the food. Again, basic sanitation. And this is true for all food in the state of Oregon, not just cannabis. We also regulate weights and measures, as Patrick mentioned in the previous presentation. So anything that has to be um, weighed, if it's sold by weight, if you're paying your employees by weight, for example, then you need to have a scale that is licensed with the department and appropriate for trade. Ag water quality, your activities cannot impact waters of the state, be it ground or surface water. So this is what happens to water leaving your property. Water rights is covered through the Oregon Water Resources Department. And then like I said, industrial hemp. We also have a fee for service lab that can diagnose insects and or fungal diseases. Um, it's one of the only labs in the state, so you can bring the plant material, you can't mail it, to the department, um, set up an account, and so maybe you have, you know, some sort of fungal disease that you're not quite sure what it is, or an insect that you're not sure what it is, you can work with the department to have that identified. So, what is a pesticide, right? Geek definition, anything that kills, repels, or mitigates a pest. Insecticide, herbicide, fungicide, rodenticide. All the sides are going to be a pesticide. And then because we're the government, and in their infinite wisdom, the EPA said, not only are we going to call all the sides a pesticide, but we're going to throw plant growth regulators or rooting hormones in there. So those are regulated the same as all of the other pesticides. What is not regulated the same are fertilizers, nutrients, uh, potting soil. So ODA maintains a guide list of pesticides that can be used on cannabis, and we'll talk about that. We don't maintain a guide list for fertilizers. They are not registered the same. They do have to be registered in the state in order to be sold, and the manufacturers have to show that if they claim something like a triple 16, that they actually meet that. They do have to do heavy metal testing. So you'll see a label on there that uh, usually refers you to a website for those heavy metal test results. So if you ever have questions about fertilizers, they are covered through our pesticide program, but they're not going to have a list like, here's what you can use. So the US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, has the primary regulatory authority for pesticides under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA. That makes it a little bit difficult when the federal government doesn't recognize cannabis as a legal crop. So that's part of what today's discussion is about. Um, the Department of Agriculture has a cooperative agreement with the US EPA so that we have primary regulatory authority for pesticides in the state of Oregon. And then we also have our own State Pesticide Control Act under ORS 634 that regulates pesticides in the state. In Oregon, OSHA, does worker protection standards. So if you are not providing the appropriate um, PPE, uh, protective equipment, or one of your employees was to get sick, 
then OSHA would be the agency that you would be working with in addition to the Department of Agriculture. Realizing that probably a lot of you don't have employees and aren't gonna run into that situation, but just something to keep in the back of your mind. In order to get a pesticide registered in the United States as a manufacturer, you have to provide a lot of information to the EPA. It's gonna depend on what kind of pesticide that you wanna get registered. For example, antimicrobials, things that are killing viruses, those are gonna require a lot more information. You have to actually prove that they're effective against the pest that you're claiming they're controlling. So if you say that it controls um, salmonella on a surface, you know, it's a human um, disease that we're concerned about, you actually have to show it's effective. If you're saying it's controlling house ants, you don't have to show that it's effective. They figure the market will work itself out. So if I, I claim I'm gonna control ants and I don't, you're not gonna buy my product moving forward. So there's a little bit of difference there. Um, things that go on food, those have more uh, requirements. They're looking at what is the exposure concerns for acute, so I eat it now, versus I eat that apple, for example, over the course of my lifetime. So they have to show, usually animal studies, what happens for chronic and acute exposures. They have to provide information on what the active ingredient is, what the other ingredients are, how you would find those in the environment, what lab uh, protocols would you use to find those in soil, in water, um, environmental fate. So how does it break down? Do bacteria break it down in nature? Does sunlight break it down? Does it not break down very quickly? Is it something that we expect to stick around for a long time? Does it bind tightly to soil? Does it not bind tightly? So now we have concerns that it might wash off into our waters and if it's an insecticide is it then potentially going to impact um, insects in the water that are the basis of our food chain? So they're asking for all of that kind of information. Um, what happens if you're exposed to it? Does it cause skin irritation for folks? Does it cause eye damage? Um, the other thing that I would say is this is true whether it's organic or conventional. So organic just means it's naturally occurring. It still has to go through this process. And the pesticide regulation process has nothing to do with is it organic or conventional in regards to where it can be used. I get a lot of calls where people say, I want to use this on cannabis. It's organic, right? That's OK. It doesn't matter. Just because it's uh, naturally occurring doesn't mean it doesn't have toxicity. Um, botulism is naturally occurring. And that's some scary stuff if it's not used appropriately, right? I'm still a little concerned about people injecting it into their skin, but, you know, we've done studies, right? So they take all of that information and use it to create the label. And the label is going to tell you what you need to know about that product. It's going to tell you where you can use it. That's extremely important. It's going to tell you what pests it either controls, if it's an antimicrobial, or what pests the manufacturer is going to guarantee, kind of stand behind that it controls. It's gonna tell you what application rate. So is it something that comes in a spray bottle ready to use or is it something that you need to dilute down? Depending on what crop you're applying it to or what pest you're going for, it's gonna have different directions for dilution. It's gonna have something called a signal word on it. It's gonna be either caution, warning, or danger in all capital letters, bold, that will give you an indication of the relative toxicity as it is in that container. So if it's something that you dilute down, it's before you make the dilution. So caution is going to be lower in toxicity than something that says warning or danger. Something that says danger usually is going to cause some pretty severe eye damage. If you were to get it in your eyes, it might cause some pretty severe skin burns, those kind of things. You may have two products that have the same active ingredient. And you look at this one, and it says caution. And you look at this one, and it says warning. What the heck? This one has other ingredients that are lower in toxicity than this one. So that signal word is not based on the active ingredient. It's based on the total formulation. 
It's going to have first aid directions. It's going to have um, hazard statements, environmental statements. Um, all of this, again, is based on that data that the EPA collects. And one thing, uh, when I was talking about what a pesticide was, there's something that folks don't think about a lot. Um, for example, those Clorox wipes, right? The wipes that say, um, kills 99% of viruses. Take a look at that label sometime. It's gonna have an EPA registration number. It is a registered pesticide. It's gonna have directions for how long you leave that surface wet. Most folks wipe down a surface and then they come back with a wet cloth because they don't want the chemicals on their counter and wipe it down. If you don't leave it set for the amount of time that it says, you now just smeared that salmonella that you were wanting to kill from the chicken all over your counter, right? Some bleach will say kills 99% of viruses. That bleach has to be EPA registered as a pesticide. So it can depend on what claims they make as well, because you could have another bottle of bleach, it's all hypochlorite, it doesn't make any claims, it doesn't have to go through the registration process. So just some other things to think about that you might be using in your daily life that are EPA registered pesticides. So let's go, oh, yeah. Again, we're the government, right? There's always an exception to the rule. So again, the US EPA back in the day said, well, there's some chemicals that are pretty low in toxicity. Most folks aren't gonna get, the, the risk is low, right? So they said, if there are active ingredients from this list, and they set out a list, it's thyme oil, cinnamon oil, um, lemongrass oil, you know, again, things that we would typically consider to be pretty low in risk. If the manufacturer uses an active ingredient off of that list and in other ingredients off of a list that they consider to be pretty low in toxicity, and they tell you everything that's in the bottle, they don't have to go through the federal registration process. And so we call them 25 Bs because that's the section in the Code of Federal Regulation that says they're exempt from a registration. Now they do have to be registered in the state of Oregon. So these products also can't claim to control human health pests because remember we said those things actually have to show that they're effective. So they would have to go through a registration process. Um, false or misleading statements. Sometimes these products like to make really wild claims like, you know, kills bed bugs first time. Sorry, that's probably unlikely to be true. So part of why Oregon registers them is to make sure that they're meeting these requirements and not making wild claims. So let's talk about a label. Let's walk through one. This is on ODA's guide list. So this is a label from a product that would be not illegal for use on cannabis. It's a biofungicide, so this is um, Bacillus ameliocaphesiens. Anyway, it's a soil bacteria, right? So it's naturally occurring. You'll see it says for organic production and OMRI listed. Does that have anything to do with why it's okay to use on cannabis? Doesn't matter. Those are marketing claims. It just means it's naturally occurring. On the right hand side, it tells us it's five pounds. It tells us the EPA registration number. So we know this is a registered pesticide. Also has an establishment number, tells us exactly where it was manufactured. So if there's issues, the agencies can backtrack and figure out where contamination may have entered, entered the product. It's got a caution signal word. So this, as it comes before you dilute it, is relatively low in toxicity. Those are all things that we can pick up just from the front. It's got first aid information, what to do if you get it in your skin, what to do if you get it in your eyes. Tells you what to wear. So that personal protective equipment, PPE, it's gonna tell you to wear long pants, long sleeves, waterproof gloves, shoes plus socks. I would recommend you wear this regardless of what pesticide you're applying, right? Some of them are kind of homeowner products. They're super low in toxicity, those 25B. They're not gonna have label language like that. But if they're killing, repelling, or mitigating a pest, there's some inherent toxicity there. Just take the time to protect yourself. Basic precautions. Um, 
talks about not applying to water or to areas where surface water is present. Talks about uh, not applying when weather conditions favor drift. So if the wind is screaming and blowing towards your neighbor's property, probably not a good time to make an application because we probably will end up getting a phone call and then we have to call you and it's a pain for all of us, right? So be thoughtful about when you're using these products. <coughs> Goes into directions for use. And this is a super long label, right? Lawyers wrote this and then they put it in really tiny font on one of those little pull-out books. They are telling you everything you need to know here. Do not be afraid to get out a magnifying glass. Um, even with perfect vision, sometimes I've used them, right? This one has something called a restricted entry interval. So after you spray, you have to wait four hours before you can re-enter that area, unless you're wearing appropriate clothing. And the reason for that, it needs time to dry, needs time to adhere to the plants so that you're not brushing up against it, maybe as somebody coming back in to work with the plants as opposed to be making the pesticide application. So some labels will have that. You need to be reading through there like you would a recipe, right? Making lasagna, you want to read through each of those steps or you're going to mess something up. This is what we're talking about here. Mixing and handling, then it starts going into the crops and what diseases they say that it's going to control. You can't see it from the back, but they've got some like superscript tiny numbers. We'll talk about that in a second. Ground application, aerial application, chemigation. How fun would it be to have a cannabis field big enough that it would be cost effective to spray by airplane. I think that would be kind of interesting. We'll, we'll be there at some point, right? Again, crops, those superscript numbers, they're trying to fit a lot of information on a really tiny label. So these superscripts uh, apply at or immediately following planting. They're going to go into some more specific information that you need to be aware of foliar application, soil application, banded in furrow application, and then there's this chart on figuring out what rate you apply for a banded application per acre, right? I've worked with pesticide enforcement for 12 years. I don't know how to do this, right? All of my pesticide experience is uh, theoretical geek enforcement stuff, right? ODA has staff who have actually worked in the field doing pesticide applications. We will help you make these calculations if you get into this and you're like, I don't know what the heck I'm supposed to be doing, right? Call us. We would much rather help you figure out how to apply it correctly than find out you didn't and have to come back later and talk to you. We wanna help you on the front end, not the back end. This particular one can be used in nurseries, greenhouses, shade houses. So that's the other thing. Is this product only good for indoors? Is this product only good for outdoors and I have an indoor grow? You need to be paying attention to those things. Just because it's on ODA's guide list doesn't mean you have carte blanche to use it. You still have to follow the label. <coughs> and then it talks about storage and disposal. Don't store wet products above your dry products, right? You've got a wet product, it leaks, Where's it gonna go? It's gonna drain down and contaminate your dry product below, right? These are things that we need to be thinking about. Is your storage area somewhat temperature stable? I rented a house with a garage, wasn't attached to the house, no insulation. And of all people, I think I should have known better, but uh, they had a bottle of some liquid herbicide or insecticide out there. For some reason, I thought I would do one of these to see if how full it was that bottle had froze, thawed, froze, thawed enough that it had cracked down the side. So I did this and that stuff went flying. Luckily, I had just closed my cooler that was sitting right there or I would have had that stuff inside where I put food, right? Not a good idea. So these are things that you should be thinking about and aware of. So we talked about EPA has uh, federal authority and then they delegate to ODA as the state authority. So we do some inspections under our agreement with EPA. So there are manufacturing facilities in the state of Oregon that 
produce pesticides or package pesticides. They have to maintain certain records for EPA. We go in and do record inspections on behalf of EPA. We also regulate all sales, use, and distribution of pesticides in the state of Oregon under our own state pesticide law. So we walk into stores and make sure that they're registered to be sold in the current calendar year. We make sure that they're in the original unopened container. It was great, walked into a Bymart, picked a bottle off the shelf, big puddle of stuff under there, right? And the employee goes, oh yeah, it's been like that for a week. Can I talk to your manager? Because we have issues, right? Um, folks who apply pesticides for hire, like a landscape company, for example, have to be pesticide applicators. The company has to be licensed and the employees have to be licensed. If you're applying for your own farm as an employee, you would not need to be licensed. It's only when you set yourself up as a company that goes out and does applications for others. They have to maintain certain records. So we'll go in and do record inspections. Uh, like I said, we register all the pesticides for sale in the, in the state. We're typically over 13,000 pesticide products. Your Lysol spray, that's another example that folks don't think about. Each flavor has to have a separate registration. Um, and then we do pesticide use investigations. So somebody calls and complains that their neighbor drifted onto them. Uh, we do observations where maybe we have a neighbor who um, doesn't like what their other neighbor is doing, and so we'll go out and watch during the application so we can see for ourselves what's happening. So let's talk about tolerances. I talked about food, and they require a lot more information if a pesticide is going to be used on food. They take that information and determine how much residue can be on the food crop when it's harvested. So again, taking an apple as an example, doesn't matter if it's conventional or organic, they're gonna say, we can use this chemical on an apple, and they've taken into account the fact that that chemical might be used in here to control insects. It might be used out in your lawn to control insects. What's the exposure for the people making the application? And what's the exposure for you as a consumer, either um, in your home, in your landscape or eating that apple. They're also gonna take into account the fact that my five-year-old would drink a gallon of apple juice a day if I let him, and he's a much smaller body, so his exposure is gonna be much greater than mine where I might drink a glass of apple juice a month, right? And so they take all of those various routes of exposure into account, make sure that it is an acceptable level of risk, nothing is safe, it's an acceptable level of risk. And then they determine, okay, if you apply this product at this rate, this long before you harvest the crop, we're gonna allow you to have this much of that chemical left on the apple. So that's called a tolerance. So I mentioned earlier, EPA doesn't recognize cannabis. They haven't done any of that. So there are no pesticides registered for use on cannabis, other than a couple herbicides for killing ditchweed, but in that case, it's a pest, not the crop, right? We could have taken the stance in the state of Oregon and said, well, it hasn't gone through that process. There's nothing registered for use. You can't use a pesticide on cannabis. I don't think that's a very realistic approach, especially when we're trying to take an industry that has traditionally been black market or not necessarily done things according to the same standard as other agriculture. And for our purposes, it's one of 230 some odd crops that we work with in the state of Oregon. So we took a different approach. We said, if a product meets the criteria, it would not be illegal for use on cannabis. And so the criteria is the active ingredient has to be exempt from the requirement of a tolerance. So the EPA has said that some active ingredients are low enough in toxicity that they're not gonna worry about establishing a tolerance. So some of those are EPA registered, some of those are those 25B that we talked about, right? Thyme oil, cinnamon oil, those kind of things. The next um, requirement is that the product label has to be pretty broad. 
If you have a label that says rosemary and thyme, those are the only two crops you can apply that product to. But if it says herbs such as, we just gave ourselves some legal wiggle room, right? Green edible crops outdoors, green edible crops indoors. I mean, some are super broad. Or they'll just say plants such as, instead of this one, this one, this one. And then the third criteria, if a pyrolysis study has been done, i.e. what happens when you smoke it, and it did not fail, then it's included on ODA's guide list. Quick thought about the pyrolysis study. Some folks have said, well, what about tobacco? Why don't you just let us use what they let people use on tobacco? Well, I don't give tobacco to medically compromised children, number one. Number two, back in the late 80s, the EPA came out and said, you will literally die of cancer before we think you're going to have issues from chronic exposure to pesticides. So we are no longer going to evaluate pesticides used on tobacco for chronic exposure. They look at acute exposure, so the people making the application, the people harvesting the plant material, but they don't look at what happens over the course of your lifetime. They don't look at what happens when you heat it. We do know some can be really scary, right? Microbutanil, eagle fungicide, has been used in the industry before marijuana was legalized. Not a legal use. It's great on wine grapes. Not so much on cannabis. A big lighter is enough to turn that microbutanil into hydrogen cyanide. So you really want to be sure that you're not using things off-label. We don't have the science to support it. And so this is the next best thing that we have available to us right now. So we talked about how a pesticide enforcement, what we do at ODA. Um, your neighbor calls and says you drifted onto them. You have an employee who says, hey, ODA, my boss made me apply X, Y, and Z, and I know it was illegal. ODA is going to come out and do an investigation. Our traditional investigation process, we're going to do interviews, we're going to talk to the neighbor, we're going to talk to the employee. We don't want to just talk to the owner. We want to talk to the person who actually made the pesticide application. Because sometimes owners say, oh no, we didn't do that. Turns out the employee did something the owner didn't know about. We're going to collect photos. We're going to want to see the product label. And we want to see the product label that you had. Because maybe you bought that product last year and it had specific language on it that the manufacturer pulled off of what they're selling this year. If you can't show me last year's label with that specific language, I'm going to have to hold you to the label I have access to. So keep copies of your label. You can keep a photocopy. You can peel that label off of there and put it in a book. Whatever works best for you. But I highly recommend keeping copies of your labels. We're going to look at the information uh, equ equipment and see, you know, is it old and worn out and maybe leaking? Maybe you need to replace nozzles on your, your spray equipment, right? Those are important things to be thinking about. We may collect samples, so drift will collect like foliage or swab samples from where we don't think it should be back to where you made the application. And if we can show a gradient of increasing amounts of that chemical, you probably drifted. We can show that. And we're going to take all of that information together and put it in a report. If there's no issues, we're done. If we think there's issues, then we're going to go into maybe a letter of advisement. We think you did something wrong, but we can't prove it. But we're going to send you a letter and put you on notice. We could go to a notice of violation. That is a enforcement action. It gives you legal rights. You can contest it. Does not involve a financial penalty but it does go on your record for three years. So if you have future violations, it can ramp you up to a civil penalty, which is also an enforcement action, gives you legal rights, but includes a financial penalty. Then we can also make referrals to other agencies. We can issue stop sales, which you may be on ODA's listserv or get it through OHA or OLCC, where we find products are illegally contaminated with active ingredients that the manufacturers didn't tell us about, or fertilizers that 
you know, wink, wink, nod, nod, it makes you grow great roots because we put a plant growth regulator in there, a rooting hormone, right? That's a pesticide, it needs to be registered. So we'll issue a stop sale. So we talked about ODA's guide list, right? And then you've got your testing requirements from the rules set out by Oregon Health Authority. There's 59 different active ingredients that cannabis has to be tested for. If you fail, you're above those action levels. Remember, those are action levels, not tolerances. There's no um, EPA risk assessment that's been done. It's the best information that we have to make uh, some level of safety for stuff entering into the marketplace. So if you fail and you're above that action level, for all of those active ingredients except for two, if you use that product, you flat out used a pesticide illegally. And so you will be referred to the Department of Ag's pesticide program for follow-up. Now there are two active ingredients that are on both lists. So pyrethrins and piperineal butoxide your, your cannabis is going to be tested for it, but ODA has products that are registered on the guide list that have those active ingredients. And so for those two only, there is a remediation process. If you can show that you used a product on the guide list and according to the label directions. So again, another reason to keep a copy of your pesticide labels so that you can show us which product you used. Spinosin, that's one of those that's OMRI listed typically. It's a natural soil occurring bacteria. Organic, causes sterility in male dogs when they did the studies. It has an established tolerance. So just because it's organic and naturally occurring does not mean it doesn't have to go through that process. As of May 1st, ODA had 120 failed growers referred to them from both OHA and OLCC since October of 2016 when the new testing rules went into place. That is a lot of samples if we were to go out and do that full investigative process that I mentioned because we would come out and test everything that's growing, all the plant material that you have at your facility. And does that encourage people to do the right thing when they're just getting started and learning about the new regulatory structure that they need to be part of. So as a state, we decided to do what we call the Marijuana Compliance Assistance Program. So if you get referred to ODA, we will give you the option to do a full investigation or to do this Compliance Assistance Program. Um, you do agree to a violation, so you get one of those notice of violations that goes on your record, so if you were to have future issues in the next three years, it could ramp you up. It doesn't count against your license or registration with OLCC or OHA, so that doesn't become an issue. Um, you do have to agree to pass a basic laws and safety test to show that you now have some knowledge. You need to tell us all the products that you've used. You need to tell us everything that you have growing or in possession. And the reason for that is if that fails moving forward, it won't count against you. It'll only be stuff that you started growing after you met with ODA, right? Because then you have knowledge. So the idea being stuff you have currently in, in the growing cycle, you may have made an application without knowing what you were doing. We'll come out, we'll sit down with you, we'll talk to you about what you're doing, make sure that we help you understand what you need to do moving forward. And if you have employees, you need to show them the worker protection standard video and make sure that you're meeting the requirements under that. So if you're not on ODA's listserv, I highly recommend that you get on there. Like I said, if we issue a stop sale, um, I just sent one out yesterday, I think, where we had three fertilizer products that had salicylic acid in there, which is a, a rooting hormone. They should have been registered as a pesticide, so we've issued a stop sale. You can't sell them in the state of Oregon anymore. Um, anytime we add products to the guide list, sometimes people call and say, hey, why isn't this on the guide list? Maybe we missed it, 13,000 products, it's a possibility. Uh, so we'll review that label and see if it meets our criteria. Sometimes we find out that something isn't what it was supposed to be, 
and so we will take it off of the guide list. Um, Guardian was one of the early examples. That's one of those 25B products. It said it had, I think, lemongrass oil and cinnamon oil. And if you read the reviews online, it worked the first time against mites. Okay, so 16 ounce bottle, $410, lemongrass oil and cinnamon oil. So we're having Thai food in our grow house and it kills mites the first time. I'm not sure, but it sounds too good to be true. It was. The manufacturer was illegally adding abamectin, which is a great miticide. Probably did work well the first time, but didn't meet 25B requirements and a medical grower who had his stuff tested was really upset because some of the medical stuff associated with abamectin was stuff he was already dealing with and he didn't want to be exposed to something that could contribute to that. So kind of important. Um, and then any other information, the handout that we have, we just developed one for pesticides and cannabis that I sent out on the listserv. So I try to keep it to good information and not uh, swamp you with a bunch of information that isn't useful. Well, I thank you very much for your time.